Hi, today we'll take a look at the history of the discovery of DNA and its structure. You already learned about DNA. We know DNA is really, really, really long and it's organized inside of our cells. We know DNA is a twisted ladder that gets coiled around these proteins known as histones and then is further and further coiled into these egg-shaped structures known as chromosomes. We know the chromosomes are found inside of the nucleus of the cell. We also know that pieces of the DNA called genes are what's responsible for the different traits that we see in individuals, whether that's a trait for red hair or brown hair or blue eyes or green eyes or brown eyes. Uh, they're determined by our genes, and genes are made up of DNA. Now, people have long suspected that there's a type of hereditary material that's passed on from generation to generation, right? And we can see it in this family. We can see that these parents passed on whatever hereditary material they have to their children, and that's causing the children to have the same red hair color that the parents have. However, we didn't always know that DNA was the hereditary material. In fact, um, scientists used to believe that proteins were the genetic material. They were the hereditary material. And the reason they thought that is because proteins are the most diverse of all biological materials and traits are really diverse. So we thought that proteins were passed on from parent to child to create all these traits. Um, so turned out to be wrong, turned out to not be the case. It turned out to, that the answer all along was DNA, but it took us a while to get to that point. It all began with this man, Johann Meischer, and he was the first person who was able to extract DNA and describe it. And he realized that it was the substance that was rich in phosphorus and nitrogen. And here he isolated some of it in this test tube and he wrote about it, but he never discovered what DNA was. It was just this mystery substance. Uh, later on, actually much later, 60 years later, this man, Frederick Griffith, did some pretty interesting experiments with bacteria. And he realized um, this principle known as transformation. He did a lot of experiments with mice. And he took two types of bacteria. One is called the S strain of bacteria, which is actually really bad. It's lethal. It causes pneumonia, and it causes the mice to die. The R strain was another strain, another type of bacteria, and that was harmless. It didn't kill the mice at all. So he did a couple experiments. In the first experiment, he gave some mice the harmless type, the R type, the R strain. And those mice, as, as suspected, didn't die. They had a bunch of the bacteria, but the bacteria was harmless and the mice were fine and happy. In the second experiment, he gave some mice the S strain, the bad strain of bacteria. And as expected, those mice ended up getting pneumonia and dying. In the third experiment, Griffith took the bad bacteria and killed it and put it into a set of mice. And these mice ended up surviving because they were injected with dead bacteria and the dead bacteria was not able to kill these mice, which was pretty much as expected. The fourth experiment was somewhat of a, so actually a huge surprise. In this experiment, Griffith took the harmless bacteria, the R, R strain, and he took some killed S strain, so the, the lethal strain, he took some dead ones and mixed them together and put them into a mouse. And to his surprise, the mouse ended up dying. And the blood of the dead mouse contained living S cells, which was the bad bacteria. So something happened here. The um, dead bacteria took something from themselves, and, and that material was transformed. It was transferred into the harmless bacteria. So somehow, the harmless bacteria took up something from the dead bacteria, and the harmless bacteria became harmful. This was a type of transformation. And Griffith didn't know what exactly passed between the dead bacteria and the living ones. Um, he didn't discover it, but other scientists picked up this mystery. Here are a scientist who picked up on Griffith's research. Um, this is Oswald Avery and Macklin McCarty. And they set out to discover what was this transforming principle, what was moving from the dead bacteria into the living bacteria, allowing the living bacteria to kill. And he tried a couple things. He tried to basically um, do stuff to the dead bacteria to make it useless. So first he added lipid-destroying enzymes, then he added protein-destroying enzymes, and still the mice ended up dead. And then he tried some DNA-destroying enzymes. And when he added the DNA-destroying destroying enzymes to the dead bacteria, the mice ended up surviving. Um, when you destroy the DNA, 
no longer could the uh, material from the dead bacteria go into the living bacteria. So Avery and McCarthy concluded that DNA was the transforming material. So if you go back to this experiment, it seems like there's all this dead bad bacteria. It has some DNA, and the, the um, harmless bacteria took up some of that DNA, and now it had the ability to kill the mouse. So the material, that transforming material, was DNA, which is what um, Avery and McCarty discovered. Later on, other scientists um, helped further our knowledge, and that these scientists are Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, and they did some experiments involving bacteriophages. Uh, bacteriophages are these viruses that look super, super creepy, but don't worry, they only infect bacteria. And in a nutshell, um, viruses can't reproduce on their own, so they infect other cells and use those other cells as virus factories to make more copies of themselves. And the bacteriophage does this by infecting bacteria. And basically, Hershey and Chase wanted to find out what is the material that viruses put into bacteria um, that they use to then make copies of themselves. In the first experiment, they tried to see if it was protein. Is it protein that's being inserted into the bacteria? And it turned out, no, it's not protein. The viruses are not putting protein into the bacteria. The protein's staying on the outside inside of the virus. And in the second experiment, they wanted to see, is it DNA that the viruses infect the bacteria with? And they used like radioisotopes, and you can read a little bit more about it. But here, that turned out to be the case, that yes, um, viruses copy themselves by putting their DNA into bacteria cells, and then that DNA hijacks the bacteria cell, and now the bacteria is going to turn into a virus factory. So Hershey and Chase learned further proof that uh, DNA is this, is this form of hereditary material. Okay, um, this man, Erwin Shargoff, uh, actually looked at the structure of DNA, and he discovered that DNA is made up of mainly four bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, which we're going to look at later. And sometimes we just use A for adenine, T for thymine, and C for cytosine, and G for guanine. And he discovered their relative proportions in a regular body cell. He found that um, DNA is 30.3% adenine, 30.3% thymine, 19.5% guanine, 19.9% cytosine. So if you notice, the numbers between A and T are really close. And the numbers between G and C are really quote, close. And this is because, and we're going to learn this later, um, A and T are bonded with each other, and G and C are also bonded with each other. So they're going to always appear in equal proportions. So we still didn't really have a good idea. We knew DNA was probably the hereditary material, but we didn't know what its structure was until these people came along. So this is Rosalind Franklin, and she used x-rays, and she spent a lot of time researching with x-rays to create the first photograph of DNA crystals, and she was able to photograph the structure of DNA, and she was able to um, calculate that DNA was extremely long and um, her work was actually super, super, super important. And these two guys, Watson and Crick, were trying to figure out the structure of DNA. I mean, they used cardboard cutouts. They were, like, trying to find chemists to help them. They were searching for information on, on what DNA is. And finally, they came upon Rosalind Franklin's pictures, and that was the missing piece to their puzzle. They were able to create the DNA model, and they actually won the Nobel Prize for their work. Um, it's unknown whether Rosalind Franklin would have gotten a Nobel Prize for her work, because at that time, sometimes women weren't um, given the credit they deserved, but she ended up passing away. She ended up um, developing cancer, probably because of all her exposure to x-rays. But her work was very important um, in Watson and Crick's work, which led to our understanding of, the, of how DNA is structured, which is what we're going to look at next. So uh, DNA is a winding staircase. We also call it a double helix. Um, it's like a twisted ladder, and it's composed of two parallel strands, and they are held together by weak hydrogen bonds between them, right? Here are the hydrogen bonds. Um, and DNA is made up of linked subunits known as nucleotides. So this is one nucleotide, this is another nucleotide, this is a third, this is a fourth nucleotide. Um, so these repeating sub subunits are called nucleotides. And the DNA sequence is the order of these nucleotides in a strand of DNA. So even though the nucleotides, there's only four varieties of them, 
DNA is very, very long, and the sequence, the order of those nucleotides can lead to that huge amount of diversity that we see in living things. Um, parts of a nucleotide. A uh, nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group, there's a five carbon sugar, and there's a nitrogenous base. And the nitrogenous bases come in four varieties. We have adenine, thiamine, guanine, and cytosine. So um, based on Shargoff's rule, adenine must pair with thiamine, and guanine must pair with cytosine. Remember, they're in equal proportions to each other, and they're paired together with these weak hydrogen bonds. Now, one more thing to know is um, these nitrogenous bases are either purines or pyrimidines. And adenine and guanine are our purines. They are double rings. So there's two rings, as you can see over here. And then pyrimidines are a single ring, and that includes thymine and cytosine. Now, purines only pair with pyrimidines, so we have here um, G pairing with C, and that requires three hydrogen bonds between them. And between adenine and thymine, there's two hydrogen bonds. So this is a little bit further information on those nitrogenous bases, those A, C, Ts, and Gs. Finally, um, DNA isn't exactly parallel. We call it anti-parallel. So one strand of DNA goes from a 5' prime to a 3' prime end, and the other strand is upside down. It goes like this from 5' prime to 3' prime, or it's in the opposite, 3' prime to 5'. prime. You can see that there, and one of them is upside down, right? So they're anti-parallel. We don't call them parallel. The 5' prime and 3' prime refer to the carbon numbers in the DNA's sugar backbone. So this is the sugar in DNA. Right? And by the way, the backbone of DNA is made up of sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. So repeating sugars and phosphates make up um, the outside. And then the rungs of the ladder are the nitrogenous bases. I wanted to clarify that. Okay, so the five prime sugar um, is over here and it's attached to a phosphate group. And the three prime sugar is over here and it's attract, uh, attached to the OH or hydroxyl group. And it's just a way so that we can... Um, label how that DNA is organized. But you do the main takeaway from this is that the DNA is anti-parallel. So one strand goes like this and the other strand is upside down. All right, so that was an introduction to how DNA is structured, how it's organized. I hope that was helpful.